Hello everyone and welcome to the very first webinar for uh, the Nordic Mensa Fund. We are very happy to see that, uh, well, so far a few, quite a few people have joined us. Um, this is the first, hopefully, of many events, live events that we will be doing, but this is the premiere. Uh, before I present today's uh, main events, uh, just a few words uh, about the fund and, and what we're doing here. Um, as you probably know, the Nordic Mensa Fund uh, was set up uh, quite recently. Actually, we began operations in uh, 2020, and uh, we have since then supported uh, with small project grants, and we have awarded um, uh, research articles within the areas of the fund, that is uh, things to do with intelligence, research to do with intelligence, uh, within uh, psychology, um, uh, medicine, education, etc. Um, and actually, uh, we have a call open for nominations and applications right now. You have one last chance today, because today is the deadline to make, uh, for instance, nominations for uh, which articles we are supposed to award or we should award uh, this year. So if you have read any interesting articles, research articles about intelligence within the past year, please uh, feel free to award um, or to nominate uh, these articles for an award. Um, I should also say that the Nordic Mensa Fund is supported by um, the four Nordic Mensas who have each appointed a person to the board. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Janis Silvest. I'm the chair of the board of the Nordic Mensa Fund. Um, they also provide some basic funds for us, but we uh, can always use more. Right now, we are fairly poor and we would like to be able to give money more money to research so if you feel like it feel free to um, um to send us some money you can do that by accessing the nordic mensa fund website uh, and there you can find out how to donate to the fund and if you do so actually we can uh, give you a small token of appreciation which is our beautiful um, pins that you see here in the in the picture and um, which are exclusive for our donors and show the beautiful logo that we have in the fund. Okay, um, one final practical issue before I um, present our speaker for today is um, the practical, yeah, the, the stuff about how you can participate. If you have questions along the way, you can write them in the chat if you're one of the live audience. Uh, we will uh, gather the, uh, the questions and we will ask them to Martin after his uh, presentation. Um, but um, the, yes, as I said, the chat will be visible during the live transmission, but will not be visible afterwards and this is because we will be recording everything and make it available on youtube and on our website if you want to see it later or if somebody else was not available to participate today so um, if you have questions during the presentation that we will begin shortly then feel free to put them in the chat and they will be communicated to us so that we can uh, have a small discussion after the presentation and without further ado, I will present the speaker of today, who is um, Professor Martin Nordin from the uh, University of Göteborg, who will be talking to us about um, the impact of education or the connection between education and uh, the intelligence, I believe. Ah, there it was, intelli-education and cognitive functioning across the lifespan. And we are very happy uh, to have Martin with us today. He was actually one of our first, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, recipients of the award for the article of the year. He, uh, 
he got that uh, award in 2022, and we're very happy that he has uh, agreed to come and present um, his uh, research for us today. Um, this will last something in the order of 30 to 40 minutes, and then there will be time for questions uh, afterwards. So please uh, make note if you have some questions along the way, and I hand the floor to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you uh, to the Nordic Mensa Fund for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak on what I think is a very important topic. And this topic uh, that I will speak to you today about is the association between education and intelligence across the lifespan. Educational attainment and intelligence is related. This association is clear in the scatter plot here, for example, which depicts the intelligence and the educational attainment of about 200 individuals from northern Sweden. Every dot here symbolizes an individual. The association is far from perfect, but many of those individuals that perform better on the intelligence test also tend to have spent more years in education than those that perform lower in intelligence. Education here and throughout the talk does not include all forms of more informal education later in life, but only the formal education that we go through in school and university as kids and younger adults. That is, those fights we have with learning how to read and do math, um, the struggle to learn strange French vocabulary, or the prepositions in German for accusative case, Deutsch für gegen um, ohne um, which I still remember, or understanding photosynthesis in biological class, and, and so forth. Uh, with intelligence, I will throughout the talk simply mean cognitive performance. This includes things like learning and memory, such as trying to learn the three uh, words in the Elvish language here to the left, uh, where Raza means stranger, Tudnas means guard, and Zara means old. And then a little bit later, trying to remember these, uh, this vocabulary. Do you remember it? This was it. Cognitive performance also include knowledge that we have gained, such as general knowledge of the world, for example, ge geography of Europe. This type of intelligence is often called crystallized intelligence, often abbreviated GC. Other important cognitive abilities include fluid intelligence, abbreviated GF. This is the broad reasoning ability that involves the processes of abstraction, concept formation, classification, and inductive and deductive reasoning. That type of thinking that we typically think on when we think of intelligence and classically measure with these types of matrices tests. These abilities, they vary among people, right? So some perform better than others. And these differences are also systematically organized. People who perform good on a test of a particular cognitive ability, say memory and learning, they also tend to perform good on tests of other abilities, say fluid reasoning. This common aspect of differences between people in cognitive performance is to be referred to as general intelligence or general cognitive ability, or even better, simply G. In addition to the general differences between individuals, there are also broad cognitive abilities, such as, for example, memory, that have their own unique differences between people. So, these broad cognitive abilities can be further broken down into narrow cognitive abilities. In other words, there are exceptions to the rule 
that people tend to perform equally well across different cognitive tests. For example, most individuals, they do fairly average on the tests of most abilities, like memory and crystallized intelligence, but may perform unexpectedly good or bad on all of the tests of one broad ability, for example, reasoning ability. An association between educational attainment and intelligence like this, um, in this case, uh, for this figure, uh, intelligence is measured with this is spatial fluid intelligence. An association like this does not say much about the reason for why there is a relationship between these two variables. Correlation does not imply causation. So, for example, when sales of ice cream are high, there is also more wildfires in a region, which does not mean that fires will be put out if we stop selling ice cream. The relationship arises because both are influenced by a third factor, in this case, sunny weather. Third variables like this also factor into the association between intelligence and education. For example, parental socioeconomic status is in many societies likely to affect the, both the intelligence and the educational attainment of the kid. Intelligence certainly also influences educational attainment. If you have an easier time to learn stuff in school, it will help motivation to continue in school and it will affect the grades you need to continue in school. What has been more questionable for a long time is whether education has an effect on intelligence. That is, did all the stuff you did during all these years in school make you more clever? Does education have a causal effect on intelligence? Does education really affect intelligence? This is actually a tricky question to answer. The best way to answer it would be to do an experiment or a so-called randomized control trial. You would, for example, take a big crowd of people roll the dices and put half of the people in education and half of them in no education, which often means work or unemployment. And then you will measure the intelligence of both groups uh, after education, predicting that the group that got education performs better than the other group. You can do this for shorter educational periods, but it would be obviously be unethical to do this for a long period of education with our kids in and out of school. This is what makes the question tricky to answer. But what you can do is to replace the randomization portion here, the dices with a naturally occurring reform of the educational system. This is a technique that's called a natural experiment. Natural experiments arise when comparable groups of people are sorted by nature into something like a control and a treatment group. They differ from randomized controlled trials because they are not consciously designed by a researcher, but they can, if randomization-like properties can be shown, provide answers to whether education has causal effects on intelligence. The world happens to be full of such natural experiments for the education field in particular, because we have reformed the educational system a lot during the last hundred years. Increasing education from on average four to five years to on average 14 to 15 years in Scandinavia, for example. 
This trick of using these reforms to study the causal effects of education on intelligence has been applied in many studies to address whether these reforms have led to improvements in intelligence. And our colleagues Brinch and Galloway in Norway were among the first to do this design. We have also used this design to investigate the effects of education on intelligence in Sweden. We used a reform called Einheitsskolan, the Comprehensive Primary School Reform, which was implemented between the 50s and the 60s in Sweden. The reform extended mandatory education from eight to nine years, introduced English from grade five, abolished early tracking and introduced a common national syllabus. As a side note, it is pretty interesting to note that the discussions about discipline problems in school seems to be ongoing in every generation. So this article here to the right is an opinion article from 1960 on discipline problems with the new school system. And with the image caption here under, which is very small that you wouldn't see, but trust me, uh, that it says the teacher a lamb in a wolf pack. Importantly, this reform was implemented gradually in over a thousand municipalities over 10 years in Sweden. Introducing the reform in some places over Sweden while keeping other places as sort of experimental controls, making this reform well suited for our purposes of assessing the effect of this reform on intelligence. The reform affected over 300,000 boys for whom we could get intelligence measurements from the mustering for conscription. And we focus here uh, our outcome measure on a composite measurement of four different cognitive tests measuring verbal, reasoning, visuospatial, and technical abilities. Results of this study show that the educational reform has a statistically significant effect on intelligence. The size uh, of this effect when we look at all of the 300,000 boys is about 0 0.7 IQ points. We should note that the reform came with on average three months longer education on average across all the boys that were affected, which means that if we scale up this effect, that one extra year in school comes with about two to three IQ points more of intelligence. This is far from a trivial effect. What was also interesting in this study was that the effect was socioeconomically graded, so that the effect was bigger for sons of farmers than for sons of Unqualif unqualified manual workers, qualified manual workers, and non-manual workers. This socioeconomic gradient comes partly from that the reform extended education more for sons of farmers than for sons of non-manual workers, who would to a greater extent have continued in school even without the reform forcing one more year of mandatory education. All the various studies on the causal effects of education were summarized a few years ago in a so-called so meta-analysis. Every dot in this particular figure here is the effect of a reform or a policy change on intelligence uh, in separate study. 
studies. So each red dot here is uh, symbolizing a study effect. On average, across these studies, one year of education comes with about two IQ points per year better intelligence, which is in the ballpark of our individual study that I just talked to you about. What is fascinating about these results is also that they are equally strong for what we call fluid abilities. That is, those inductive and deductive abstract reasoning abilities that we typically think on when we talk about intelligence. They are equally strong for these abilities as they are for crystallized abilities, such as remembering that Paris is the capital of this is similar to the so-called Flynn effect, that is the rise of intelligence performance during the 20th century, so that each new birth cohort has performed better and better over time. Also this effect, the Flynn effect, is actually larger for fluid abilities than it is for crystallized abilities. What is also interesting about these effects is that they are maintained throughout life. The effects of education on intelligence clearly remains unchanged well into older age, at least up to 70 years of age. So this graph that you see in front of you here depicts the gain of one year of education estimated from these types of policy change studies that I've talked to you about on intelligence in terms of IQ points. And each of the individual red dots here again reflects the estimate from different studies using this policy change trick to study the causal effects of education on intelligence. And what you can see is that those measures that have estimated uh, intelligence at the age of 18, typically at military conscription, they show effect sizes that are about the same level as those studies that have measured uh, the outcome tests of intelligence uh, when people are older, uh, late in life, up to the age of 70. So again, the effects of education on intelligence clearly remains unchanged well into older age, at least up to what we know today at the age of 70 years. So what we have is an overall picture of the association between education and intelligence across the adult lifespan looking something like this schematic drawing that I've put up here on the screen. The association between educational attainment and intelligence, uh, say fluid intelligence for example, is formed interactively during early life because intelligence influences how long you go in the educational system in, and it influences schooling. But also because schooling influences education and because third factors affect both intelligence and, uh, um, and uh, education. So what we have during development is a complex interaction between education affecting intelligence, intelligence affecting education, as well as both these uh, factors being affected by third factors like socioeconomic status. This interactive process is producing differences between people when they enter adult life. That are differences in intelligence between people that are correlated with educational statement, uh, status. So that those 
that have higher education tend to perform better on intelligence tests as compared to those that have lower education. What we know from many studies of cognitive aging and the, and the association between cognitive aging and education is that these differences between people, they remain pretty stable throughout life. And when cognitive performance is starting to decline in older age, for fluid ability starting already around mm -hmm. between the age of 50 and 60, if you trust longitudinal data, uh, these differences at initial starting point are becoming important. For example, individuals starting out higher in younger age, perhaps partly because of longer education, will everything else equal reach critical thresholds, like for example thresholds for functional impairments, such as loss of independence, at the later point in life as compared to those that start adulthood with the lower intelligence. So these early factors uh, that produce the interactions between intelligence and, cognitive, uh, and education early in life continue to be important throughout life. This we know. What we still don't know is whether it is what it is in education that influences intelligence. So what in the minds of people changes during education so that they perform better on intelligence tests? This is, of course, a question of major applied importance. Is it simply test taking skills or is it more important things like general inclination and ability to reason abstractly? Research in the future should tackle this question, I think. If you want to read more about this topic, we summarized our research and others' research on this topic uh, in a recent paper published uh, two years ago now, which received the Article of the Year Award last year from the Nordic Mensa Fund which I thank a lot for inviting me and for honoring me with this award. With this, I think I will turn over to taking questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, that was very interesting. So if I may start with, with my main question here is, what does this all mean? Do we need to put people one year longer in school so we get a, a more general or a higher intelligent uh, population overall? Or, or what, what, what can we use this for, these results? Um, yeah, I, I think a, a critical um, answer to getting research for also answering this question is uh, what I alluded to in the end of the presentation. I think it would be very important to find out uh, the exact nature of this effect of education on intelligence. So if it is simply about learning uh, to take tests in a good way, then uh, uh, extending uh, education uh, would not do much with the, the, the sort of um, um, other uh, behavior uh, in society that we need to improve, like rationality or, or, uh, or health behavior or, or, or similar stuff. But if these effects are real in the sense that they are really improving abstract thinking, reasoning skills, um, inductive and, and, and uh, deductive uh, reasoning, um, then yes, I think they have clear policy uh, implications uh, in that we 
uh, we should uh, uh, consider uh, um, or we should take it even more important uh, uh, with education of our kids than we do to already do uh, today. Uh, because we know how closely related intelligence measures are to, for example, health uh, outcomes, uh, mortality, accidents, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so that we can assume if these effects are real on intelligence, that they can also have very good benefits uh, for people's uh, life. Yes. <laughs> Yes, let me just see if we have more questions. We've had some uh, technical <laughs> issues, so not very many questions have come by. But anyway, I'll, I'll just continue asking my own questions then, uh, because um, uh, uh, we, I think everybody who has uh, any kind of interest in the issue of uh, intelligence also knows about the Flynn effect, and you mentioned it yourself. Uh, so can we even sort of disentangle sort of the effects? Uh, because as far as I know, in general, we are educated for longer now than we used to be before. And does that account for the Flynn effect? Or is it, uh, can you say a bit more about what the relationships here are? Because it's quite difficult to, to tell them apart, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, one main hypothesis of the Flynn effect um, is uh, the, the extension of education during the last uh, uh, 100 years. Mm. Um, so um, there are good data showing that uh, parts of the Flynn effect uh, co-vary with uh, uh, the, these reforms, as well as um, um, the, the extensions or the general increase of education over um, uh, the last hundred years. There is also some data suggesting, but this is more suggestive, that the recent decline in the, um, in, in the size of the Flynn effect, also at least in some countries, can be partly related at least uh, to um, also changes in educational um, um, reforms. Uh, um, uh, so, um, yes, it's difficult to, um, it's difficultly to decisively say, but um, uh, clearly um, educational um, reforms and the huge increase in education from four to five years to nowadays, at least in Scandinavia, 14 to 15 years on average, uh, seems to be uh, related to the Flynn effect. Although there are other possible uh, causes of the Flynn effect also, like nutrition improvements and, and uh, similar uh, causes. It's interesting to note that actually uh, Flynn himself um, uh, pushed a lot for the educational interpretation, and in particular, he was thinking um, he was thinking um, on the general tendency um, of people to um, better think in abstract uh, uh, terms. So, um, if you um, think back. Um, a uh, uh, hundred years, maybe your typical inclination or the typical experiences in, in daily life were not about reasoning uh, uh, about abstract things, but about more uh, concrete uh, uh, things uh, in life. And uh, with education comes a focus on abstract concept, abstract thinking, abstract rules and relationships in math, for example, but also in other fields or other classes. And uh, this is clearly things that we measure in the classic uh, intelligence test, uh, like, for example, the matrices test. This is clearly an abstract thinking uh, uh, um, test. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, we don't have decisive um, uh, data or conclusions, but um, it's likely that the educational um, uh, increases are related to the Flynn effect. Yes. Okay, uh, another, another uh, one of your slides that I found uh, quite interesting is the one that shows how these uh, cognitive effects sort of also contribute to 
pushing further out in your lifespan, uh, the sort of the decline, uh, uh, so that you sort of keep <laughs> keep your your wits about you for up uh, further up into old age than those with less education. Can you say a bit more? Or could you say a bit more about about that? And Yes, um, for for this slide, I think what's important to note and what's the major take home message um, is that um, uh, education and higher education does not seem to be particularly strongly related to actually your actual decline in old age. That is the changes in cognitive performance as you uh, grow old. Um, so that it's not the case that on average, uh, a person with higher education will show less rapid decline uh, or more rapid decline than a person with lower education. The actual decline, the, the slope of these curves, the changes of these individuals here with each curve being an individual, um, is similar uh, uh, across individuals that have higher and lower education. What education seems to do is that it's associated with higher cognitive performance, for example, memory performance or fluid intelligence or so, at the start of entering uh, uh, adulthood. So everything else being equal, if the lines the path you take through life is similar. If you start out a bit higher, you will hit thresholds like when it really starts to hurt, when you're starting to get problems functioning individually and um, independently, finding your way to, to right places and so forth, uh, which can happen when you grow very old. Uh, this point is reached at the later stage in life, at the later age. And a relatively small difference uh, of just say an IQ point or two uh, in, in intelligence and cognitive performance when you enter adult life, if these differences are maintained into old age, that can make a huge difference in the number of years that you have in healthy life before you need to um, have um, help in your life, for example. Um, so this is the major effect of education, um, that it affects the so-called level, uh, but it doesn't seem to affect the change of cognitive ability in old uh, age so much. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. I, uh, I just thought it, I mean, considering that we, that on general or on average, we are all getting older, uh, then maintaining, I mean, if it seems that you have a sort of a reserve that you can, even if you go enter into the same decline, you sort of push it a bit uh, up in age. And, and, and while we're all getting older, that seems to be um, probably a good investment if it can, can can give us all uh, or on average give us a few more years uh, where we are able to to take care of ourselves rather than having to rely on the help help of others so another um, you could say um, good good effects of or or good impact of investing in education at uh, in the early years if this if this uh, graph holds true i just found it very interesting from a sort of societal uh, point of view. Um, okay, so uh, I think I am running out of questions here. And as I said before, unfortunately, we've had a few technical problems. So uh, we don't get uh, many questions in from our audience, uh, which is, uh, yeah, we're sorry about that. But, um, but anyways, I hope that that everyone has uh, enjoyed the, the chat that we've had or the the talk and the following questions that we had uh, so far. Um, Martin, is there anything else that you would like to add at this point or? Um, no, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot to the Nordic Mensa Fund. Uh, yeah. 
Well, thank you also. I mean, we're, this was very interesting and uh, we're sorry for the technical problems, but we very much enjoyed the, the talk and uh, it will be available uh, to, to, to watch uh, both on the YouTube channel and, and I think there will be a link on our, on our own Nordic Mensa Fund website as well. So uh, thank you very much, Martin, and we very much look forward to, to see what, what will come from, from your side in the, in the years to come. I'm sure we will follow and uh, I hope maybe we can uh, perhaps uh, come back to you at some, some later point. We hope to make uh, these uh, web webinars or web streams uh, a recurring event. So, uh, so we'll see what we'll do in the future. Thank you very much for today and um, thank you to, to the audience as well. Bye for now.